Hello, and thank you for joining us. I am Paul Carpinella, and I will be serving as host of today's webinar. Today's webinar is brought to you by Clavis Insight. Our insights enable CPG, FMCG manufacturers to improve performance online by better understanding how their products and brands are represented across online retailers. You can learn more about Clavis Insight by visiting our website or by listening to our brief overview, which will occur prior to the question and answers portion. A few housekeeping items before we begin. All participants will be on mute for this call. You can ask questions at any time by posting them in the questions box located on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. It's now my, pre my pleasure to introduce today's presenter and my colleague, Danny Silverman. Danny is Global Head of Business Consulting Services for Clavis Insight. He is a CPG FMCG e-commerce business strategy and sales expert with over 10 years of industry experience. Throughout his career, he has helped brands enhance equity and drive sales at online retailers with data-driven insights and experience-informed action. Danny, over to you. Great. Thank you, and good morning or good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you for joining. We're going to be covering uh, our, our perspective on best practices in online category management. Um, just to get started, I, I suspect most are familiar with Roger's technology adoption curve. Um, and it's the, when we talk about things like innovators and early adopters or the tipping point, often it's referring to this curve. There's many different versions of it. Um, but, uh, you know, the visual here basically to illustrate where we believe we are in e-commerce, where the so-called adoption gap had sort of been where we were over the last two or three years, we now believe it's no longer a question of if or when, but how. E-commerce has tipped. It is here to stay, um, certainly in key markets, the U.S., U.K., France, China, but there's a number of other markets where there's different types of uh, e-commerce emerging, whether it's mobile or desktop, um, and different levels of, of involvement and penetration. But clearly, this is a channel that has to be addressed by uh, CPG and FMCGs. We're seeing now uh, CPG, FMCG playbooks are being written either by the early adopters or niche online-only startup brands, which have been quite disruptive because of their ability to move quickly in the online space. Um, but there's a constant innovation and new technology shop driving shopper behavior shifts. This is actually the good news because what it means is, despite those who might have gotten in early and a feeling among others of, of having to catch up, because that technology is moving so quickly, because there's so much industry churn, there's plenty of opportunity uh, to catch up and to emerge new leaders as the industry evolves. Uh, one thing that is certain is that over the next three to five years, we'll continue to see the e-commerce, FMCG, CPG industry in turmoil. And the reason for that uh, is, is not only by, driven by technology and by, uh, by the, the shopper behavior shifting itself, but also by the fact that we as FMCG, CPG uh, manufacturers uh, really have to relearn uh, an entire industry uh, differently from what's been done previously for brick and mortar. At the end of the day, while we know how to manage this, we know how to sell in a new product, we know how to set a planogram, we know how to set price and promotions, when it all of a sudden is on a screen, we're suddenly a little bit more uncomfortable. And often, we're not entirely sure why. E-commerce looks and feels and smells different, but we're not always sure what's driving that. So we're going to um, uncover a little bit of those insights today and help understand what's behind it um, to create the basis for what best-in-class online category management looks like. So in the brick-and-mortar model, it's, it's largely stack them high and let them fly. We want to get uh, displays, promotions, and, and as many new items sold in as possible. And it becomes very much a push model. Product is, is set for manufacture or is being manufactured. You have your sales uh, team that's going out to the retailer who sells the product in. Product is, is on shelf or the display or the pallet, whatever it may be. Everybody's very happy. We run a store promotion uh, or you know, whatever it may be to drive the shopper to the product. Shopper walks down the aisle. They see a product. They see a display. They make a purchase that day. This is the brick and mortar model, and, and a lot of, and all of our online category management practices are built around this push model. E-commerce turns this entire model on its head and completely reverses it. The most important thing is getting the items set up. 
uh, if that doesn't happen right at the start, everything else falls out of place after that. And the reason is uh, shoppers are largely using e-commerce for research. We know that particularly in CPG and FMCG, the majority of e-commerce and online traffic is still driving offline purchases, but it's become a critical step in that path to purchase. So when they're going online and researching a product, and what could just be pricing for their favorite product, it could be information on a new product, they could be entering a category for the first time, they're using e-commerce retailers for that point of research. If the item hasn't been set up properly to start with, they're not going to find it or they'll find it and be underwhelmed by the information they find. Then if they decide to purchase, that's the point where the online retailer will make the decision on how much inventory to purchase and replenish their existing inventory with. It's no longer a push model where we push as much inventory out and then leave it to the retailer to sell it. It's now on us as the manufacturers to drive the demand and drive the pull through so that the retailer eventually increases the amount of turn orders, uh, which then you know, fuels, of course, our manufacturing. So we've really turned this whole process from push to pull. And at the end of the day, in a pull environment, it's critical to understand category best practices and item setup best practices to be successful. So, uh, and, and, and when, you, when you really boil it down, so what is the fundamental piece behind why that push to pull shift has happened? It's because in brick and mortar, you have a planogram, you have an aisle. You find your way down the aisle, you find your way to the planogram, you have beacon brands, you shop top to bottom, whatever left to right, find the category, subcategory brand that you're looking for. E-commerce, uh, from its earliest inception, was essentially a catalog model that was converted online. And that is still in existence today at really every retailer anywhere in the world. It still comes down to one item at a time. You can't shop the aisle. The same visual cues that exist in brick and mortar just don't exist in e-commerce. It comes down to one item. So whether you're looking, I have my Europe examples for today's webinar. Um, so, but I've got the same set of examples for U.S. and other markets, whether it's Tesco, whether it's Asda, whether it's Boots, whether it's Ocado with this particular L'Oreal example, you can see um, it's all about getting the image, the title, the content right so that when the shopper gets to the retailer of choice, they're finding the right information the first time and, and being fully educated on the product and persuaded to convert whether that conversion happens online or offline. So, we're redefining category management. We're moving from the physical parameters of the, of the physical store to virtual parameters of online retail. It means looking at distribution uh, from you know, selling in one item at a time to having the opportunity to carry essentially everything, but increasingly being more selective. A couple of years ago, it was the case with certain retailers, you take Amazon as an example, we'll take everything you've got, just set it up. And we, want, we want everything you can possibly give us. Fast forward to, to where we are today, profitability concerns are creeping in, other concerns, category management starting to take hold, and it's not just at, a, a, at Amazon, it's at other retailers around the world where they're starting to be more selective. It's no longer just what, just every product, it's the right product. Um, availability is the other piece of this. In the, again, the brick and mortar world, we have our logistics and supply chains. We know exactly how it works. We know how to feed the system. Generally, a six to eight week inventory holding across the entire network at the retailer level. And online, very different, much leaner, much more nimble. Retailers tend to carry two to three weeks of inventory online. If there's any kind of unexpected spike that exceeds the forecasted demand, you're out of stock and then it can take anywhere from whatever your cycle is. It could be, could be a week, it could be three weeks to get back in stock. Uh, staying in stock online is, is actually quite harder uh, to do than it is in the brick and mortar world because we don't have the nimble processes in place to react quickly. And so there's measures that need to be taken accordingly. The physical shelf uh, is now taken in place by content. So whereas we relied on packaging before to sell the product, now it's all about having the right content, the right images, the right titles online. Um, the planogram, which was used, as I mentioned before, to help shoppers navigate, and shoppers really relied on that planogram and a, a, an underlying belief that the retailer knows which products to merchandise best from top to bottom and left to right, and using those cues to shop categories. Now it's all about search and navigation. Shoppers uh, need to, you know, are going in, they're either using keyword search or they're using the navigation if they're new to a category, to, to a category, to find uh, the products that they're looking for. Pricing, of course, has moved from a world of where pricing is relatively steady or fixed from quarter to quarter. It might change once or twice a year, maybe four times a year at most, 
the online space far more dynamic. You can see pricing changes happen within hours, um, where one retailer may make a move for some reason, and other retailers will immediately follow. We've seen that behavior only accelerate, whereas one, at one time there was only one or two agitators. Uh, almost all the brick and mortar and traditional retailers and online retailers alike have caught on to the importance of monitoring pricing and moving quickly. That brings with it a whole new host of issues that land right back with the manufacturers to solve. And then finally, promotion. So yes, we have digital banners. Uh, we have the ability to promote our products in the digital space and on the e-commerce space through various types of media or merchandising banners. I'm also going to get to, in just a moment, a little bit about ratings and reviews and how ratings and reviews also serve the role of promotions. So let's just go through each of these. Uh, this is how Clavis breaks this down, how we take an offline metric and convert it to online. In stock becomes availability, and it's about are my products in stock. Distribution is about portfolio, is it the right assortment for that retailer and that retailer's online shoppers. Packaging and digital is now all about content, is it accurate, is it up to date, and is it engaging. Planogram becomes all about search. Can the products be found easily and preferably before your competitors' products? Finally, pricing, ratings and reviews, media. This is about you know, those fundamentals of how we actually pull uh, shoppers in, uh, attract them to the product, and, and convert them on the sale. So let's talk about right assortment first. Uh, $15 per pound. This is a really interesting rule that we always get uh, raised eyebrows and questions on. It's something that I've, I've been in the e-commerce space dedicated uh, fully for over five years now, and it's something that over time I've, I've seen develop and emerge as a rule of thumb. What $15 per pound means is that in order for a retailer generally to be profitable on a product, the, AS, the average selling price needs to be approximately $15 for every one pound of the product. The lighter your product is with the higher price point, the bit more successful it's going to be online. Contrarily, if you take a product like a bleach or a laundry detergent or a mouthwash, which is low price and high weight, those have a much uh, a more difficult time in the traditional e-commerce space because it's hard for retailers to make a profit on shipping that product. What that means is for products in those segments is thinking about different pieces of the e-commerce ecosystem because now we have grocery delivery or you know, grocery truck delivery. You've got buy online, pick up in store, click and collect and other models like that where it no longer relies on the UPS and FedExes of the world, so you don't have those same shipping concerns. Uh, Non-hazmat uh, products like aerosols that can't ship by air uh, will have a, also have a more difficult time in e-commerce. And then packaging, um, is, you know, what is the right case pack? Uh, to, it, whether it's achieving that, that threshold of the $15 or more, um, or whether it's, you know, uh, you have cans or bottles or whatever it may be, there does need to be consideration of packaging. Early adopters and innovators in the space are looking at packaging for e-commerce uniquely and separately from their standard product that they're using to supply brick and mortar retail. It's costly and it's difficult and it's a real struggle, but it's uh, for those who are really succeeding and winning, they've acknowledged that whether it's Amazon's frustration-free packaging standard or any other considerations, there's a real rationale to have dedicated packaging specifically for this channel that works very well through those e-commerce distribution and shipping channels. Um, depth versus breadth. So um, it, for a long time, this was really about just you know have as many products as possible and have them up there. Now we're starting to get more into the quality of it, making sure that they're the right items for that retailer and for that shopper. Um, What's going to perform best online, this is uh, perhaps more uh, readily understood and, and out there, um, is going to be those high involvement categories where shoppers are doing a lot of research, discretion categories that they might be embarrassed to shop for in the aisle, and then daily usage products that uh, have a high turn rate. It's something they're buying every week or every month and they're shopping for best price. And then uh, in terms of product life cycle, new products also, you know, lots of research happening on those products online. Products that are having supply chain issues or perhaps have been uh, discontinued at many retailers and are hard to find that target a very niche audience are the so-called long tail products also do incredibly well. One thing every brand will find the first time they turn on their e-commerce data is they will be surprised to find that their 20% yeah, of items driving 80% of their sales does not look anything like the items that are driving the same in brick and mortar. And that's because a different audience has sought out those products to date. As e-commerce normalizes and grows, we might see that shift back um, with our power SKUs offline being powerful online as well. But at least initially in early days, it's those niche and hard to find products that perform particularly well online. 
And then finally, which probably all of us can appreciate, is, is that e-commerce is understood in your business planning and product life cycle and it's properly funded. Um, it, it, and this really does get back to having the right assortment and the right approach to all the above pieces because if you don't fundamentally have an understanding in your organization of what is your e-commerce strategy, what is the role of e-commerce in your overall strategy, then you're going to struggle with being a participant in the business planning process and getting the appropriate funding. It could be anywhere from e-commerce as sales for the sake of sales all the way through to e-commerce for the sake of engagement and being agnostic to whether the sale happens online or offline. Those are the opposite ends of the, of, the, of the spectrum and as a result have very different roles in business planning and very different roles in funding. All of that will then feed back on figuring out what's the right assortment and how is it going to be properly packaged and supported online. The next piece which I touched on was availability. Um, in, the, in the offline world, we might have looked at inventory or in-stock levels, perhaps weekly, perhaps monthly, and looking back and saying, you know, which store uh, is having some issues, what parts of the country, why is that, is it weather related, whatever it may be, kind of a slower cycle and, and a little bit less concern because a little outage here, a little outage there isn't going to negatively impact the number in a big way. Online, sales move so quickly and sales can spike so quickly. Uh, daily uh, monitoring of in stocks becomes more critical than ever. The sooner you know you've gone out of stock, the sooner you can react and try and get back in stock. And what's more is then influence the retailer to increase the amount of inventory that they are holding to cover the increase in demand. So um, going from, you know, having dashboards and tools available that monitor your, your in stocks, your out of stocks, your in store only on a day to day basis. Void being if you've lost the buy box to a third party seller on Amazon or if the page has been pulled off the site completely by a Target or Walmart because the product's been out of stock for an extended period of time. Being able to then drill down to that at the retailer level and then knowing at the retailer and item level on a day by day basis <clears throat> when exactly did the product go out of stock and understanding what triggered it. Was it a media event? Was it a PR event? Uh, you know, television, whatever it might have been, uh, a promotion so that you can learn from that for the future and as you replicate that event, um, be, be better prepared from an inventory standpoint, not to mention, of course, reacting and getting back in stock as quickly as possible. So we need to move to the next piece, which is search. <clears throat> Question, uh, we actually don't often get this, but we put, because there's an assumption, um, but we put this out there, how do shoppers search? The predominant belief is that the vast majority of shoppers use keyword to search. Uh, and that statistic has been put out there by certain online retailers in the past and no doubt is correct for certain online retailers. We would submit, however, uh, based on data we've seen and research we've done that it actually depends. It depends on four things. The retailer, the trip mission, the shopper preference, and category. And I'll give two very different examples. If you are a, 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 mom, a mom or dad and buying diapers on a regular cycle, you know exactly what size, you know exactly what, what product, you're going to use the keyword, you're going to use the search bar, you're going to enter your brand or product if you haven't just used your reorder or replenishment um, uh, functionality and find the product, go straight to it. If you're a new mom or dad and, or you're having a problem with diapers and you're trying to figure out what else is out there, you might instead use the navigation and say, well, let's see at the category, let's go to the diaper category and go down to size and see what are all the options and by the way, what are shoppers like me saying about it in ratings and reviews. If you think about um, a new website you've never been to, a clothing retailer, all the way through to a grocery or CPG retailer, it's really going to vary um, on how you use that, whether you're using keyword or menu. Um, also, shoppers will have different preference based on their maturity and, and comfort level with e-commerce. Uh, so for that reason, uh, I'm going to start with menu and then we'll go to uh, search terms in a moment. Um, but just to give you a sense of how complicated menu can be, and again for today I've used examples from, uh, from UK retailers, it can be very simple um, where you know it's a series of drop downs and you can see what you've selected. It can get more complex where each category leads to a subcategory or each category leads to a subcategory leads to another subcategory or even an incredibly low level of detail where now there's even an opportunity to be cross listed in multiple categories and cross segments because the uh, retailers online catalog is just is so uh, parsed and, and, and spread out into micro categories and subcategories. Compare this to the offline world where you just go to the hair care set and you can navigate all the different pieces of it. Now you've got to really think about how do I find my way to just that portion of hair care or you know just hairspray or just shampoo, whatever it may be. 
Um, you know, and then and then the other piece of it is, of course, shampoo is of course keywords. For those who who know me, I love using shampoo. I have two favorite categories that I like to use in my example: shampoo and coffee. So we'll bounce between those two, but shampoo is near and dear to my heart. Um, so uh, when you take a look at shampoo uh, as an example, these are the search results on one retailer. You see a combination of of promoted placements as well as organic placements. In some cases, you'll have retailers where all of the first results are entirely promoted. Um, and then you have to scroll way down the page to see the organic search results. Uh, you may have, again, a blend of it, um, and, and so on. And what's common across all of these is the lack of commonality of what's being surfaced. So uh, approaching search and search optimization really is a retailer by retailer uh, approach. And you need to understand what is your share of search, what is your search ranking, on your key terms that you need to win on. So if shampoo is a key term to win on, then you're going to want to optimize things like titles and features and descriptions so that you're coming up first in search, not to mention, of course, driving that demand so that when based on sales, you're, you're of course, also fueling that piece of the search algorithm uh, as the preferred product for the retailer's surface. As we move ahead into price, so price is one of those areas where uh, there's certainly more sensitivity. Pricing is at the sole discretion of the retailer. Um, and there's, there's obviously little to nothing that manufacturers would do, particularly in certain markets, to influence or even discuss price. But it is important to understand what's happening with price from an observational standpoint um, in the e-commerce space. In the brick and mortar uh, traditional model, we know who our retailers are, we know who our distributors and wholesalers are, we sell to them, the product ships to them, everything's, everything's grand. Um, the challenge, though, is that with the power of mobile, uh, re shoppers from the aisle can now compare prices across retailers, and retailers who have third-party marketplaces to resell uh, product also influence that pricing dynamic and can really create disruption in the market. We call this an optics problem. Uh, for example, a, a, a third-party seller in, on Amazon in the U.S. might have five pieces of product that they're selling at 50% of the MSRP. Now, all the online retailers are carrying thousands of pieces, and they're established, but if that shopper sees that price at 50% of the others and are influenced to purchase, all of a sudden you have disruption. You have retailers who are upset. They want to know what's going on and why you can't control your supply chain and your retailers. And the manufacturer is sort of sitting there saying, well, I don't even know who the seller is, much less be able to do anything about it. Can't you fix it? And every time the retailers say, no, it's up to you to figure out how they got your product. So, uh, there's no there's no one easy solution to that. Um, it's something that uh, requires uh, research and, and an in-depth uh, secret shopper audits and, and so on and so forth to really understand what's causing that kind of disruption if it's there. But the overall thing that we recommend to consider with pricing in a fully transparent model, whether it is uh, your official channels or the unofficial channels, is that think about pricing as a function of supply and demand, much like the stock market. The more supply outstrips demand, the more problems you're going to have with pricing stability in the marketplaces. In the marketplace, um, if you run a big promotion and you sell, you know, a million pieces through displays, and you have 10,000 left over at a retailer, and they liquidate it at a fraction of the price, that product is eventually going to make its way back online. Whereas before, it was unseen in flea markets or the or the liquidators like the big lots and job lots of the world. Um, now these sellers are bringing that product online, and all of a sudden starts creating that disruption. So what used to be a very known model for how we liquidate and get rid of leftover remnant product, now that it resurfaces online and the power of mobile allows the shopper to compare it, it becomes problematic. It's a very difficult problem to solve because at the end of the day it means restricting supply to meet demand. And that's something that few manufacturers are ready to do. But I can tell you from a first-hand basis, I've seen uh, customers we've worked with make this decision on certain brands that they had to get control of the situation, and the only way they could influence it was by becoming more restrictive on the amount of product going out and having a clear um, model for who they would sell product to and how that product is managed accordingly. Again, all of this doesn't get it and doesn't get anywhere near talking to the retailer about price. This is just about managing your supply chain as a key factor in the online space which is something that we don't see offline because you don't have that same transparency when you're standing in a physical aisle. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll move on to promotion. And, and I, I don't go into too much depth. I'm not going into any depth today on the media piece or the digital banner piece. It's a completely separate topic. But what I did want to come back to was my comment earlier on about how uh, ratings and reviews plays a role in promotions. 
So if you go to the core of what a promotion is all about, a promotion is about interrupting the trip. The shopper is going, this is the coffee aisle, they're going to purchase folders, they get to the aisle and they see a deal on Maxwell House um, and they say, uh, you know, I, I, I'm in, that's fine, I could go either way, I'll go based on price, I'll buy Maxwell House and the promotion has served the role of interrupting the trip. It's the same purpose of why we put displays in the aisles, why we put pallets at Walmart, um, because we're trying to interrupt the trip and steer the shopper from what might have been a competitive purchase to a purchase of your own brand. Ratings and reviews can actually serve the exact same purpose. Whether a shopper is researching or going to buy the product they've been using, they're very aware of what the rating and review on that product is, and they're going to make certain considerations based on what they see. And it's really a function of two things, what the average rating is, but also the number of reviews. We know that if the number of reviews is generally below 20, shoppers are going to be sus suspect of whether or not that's a valid average rating score. Once you get up above 20, it gets much more valid, and actually the more ratings there are, the higher conversion goes. And there's some really good statistics out there from some of our partners um, that, that uh, show the correlation between the, not only the, the rating itself, but the number of reviews and the correlation to conversion. Just to take you through the example uh, on the slide here of coffee, at the top right, Maxwell House there has eight reviews. Now, this was a pantry item at the time we took the screen grab. Pantry was still fairly new, and uh, this would have been a new listing, and so they were just building up reviews. But if I'm a shopper and I look at this and I'm new to coffee for whatever reason, or I want to switch coffees and I see eight reviews, I'm not that, that rating to me doesn't hold any water. So I might move on. Same thing with Dunkin' Donuts. It has nine reviews. There's a niche product at the bottom here called Coffee Bitch Slap Extra Strong and Extra Smooth High Caffeine Coffee Whole Bean. Clearly a brand that ha is very niche and, and, and very aware of how to optimize a title for, for search terms. Um, has 21 reviews, so I may or may not be influenced by that. It might get my interest and I might click into it to see you know, what, what's this product about and what are reviewers saying about it. We go to Café Du Monde, which is a uh, coffee out of, out of New Orleans has a very loyal following um, and has very high demand in the online space for those who can't get it locally, um, has 111 reviews and they're four and a half five star reviews. So very powerful. Again, if I'm new to coffee or looking for a new brand, I will be interested in purchasing that product. Um, and then we take a look at the two K-Cup products, the Keurig 8 o'clock coffee, uh, 385 reviews, and Keurig Original Donut Shop 3,364. Particularly on that last example, this is a brand that has worked very hard to cultivate their online presence and their online shoppers, and, and that, that 3,000 plus review mark is not, is not an accident. Um, it's, it's part of a focus strategy that, that, um, that certain brands have deployed and, and is certainly a best practice. Uh, and then finally, we'll, we'll end with engaging content. So I'm back to my favorite category of shampoo. And I love this example because this is not a mainstream brand. This is not from a top company, a, a top 10 you know, manufacturer. Um, came up very high in search results for shampoo on Amazon at the time. And it's not a surprise why. They have optimized this product for search. Now, you can absolutely go to an extreme on this and a shopper will kind of smell foul and, and, and say, I, this, I'm, being, I'm being fooled here. They've, they've gone too far. They see these crazy titles that are 100 characters long or whatever, and they, they know that there's something going on. So there's a balance to be found here, but I like this example because they've put in several key terms right into their title. Best shampoo for men is a key search term. Tea tree oil is a key search term. Dandruff and reduced dandruff. Hair loss. These are all important search terms that will help drive their search results. Now if you move down to the feature bullets, very often we take the whatever descriptions or features are on the bottle or the product and we copy those over and put them online because that's all that legal has approved. Either that or what's on the website and we're limited, our hands are tied to it. Um, brands who are moving more quickly, whether they are uh, an established manufacturer or some of these niche, smaller, online only or startup brands, uh, don't have those kinds of limitations. They've moved much more nimbly and quickly, and they've been able to really expand on benefits. And the, the, what they've done here is created a feature benefit statement for each of these. It's not just about tea tree oil. It's what are the benefits of tea tree oil. It's not just about, um, you know, the, the Krieger and Sohn brand. We don't know what that means. They've taken the point here to actually explain what Krieger means and what the brand means. The other thing they've done here, which is super interesting, is they haven't just taken product shots of the bottle. They've done something you can't do at brick and mortar. They've shown what the product looks like coming out of the bottle. 
this can be hugely influential, not just in hair care, but you think about a product like toothpaste, where offline you can look and figure out, is this the gel or is this the paste? Online, that can be a little bit harder to tease out. <coughs> Excuse me, with the visual of the product itself, the goo in the bottle, you can you know, really uh, sell the product and make sure the shopper feels comfortable that they're buying the right thing. The overall message here is consider that in the online space you have a much broader canvas. You have far more room to describe the product, to sell your product, and to engage your shopper than you've ever had in the brick and mortar space. This requires a different set of skills and resources and support to be able to make that content available because if you just limit yourself to what's available for the brick and mortar product, you're not fully optimizing the potential of this channel um, and you're missing an opportunity to really excel above potential competitors. So as, as we conclude and wrap up today, it, as I said up front, the, the emergence of e-commerce as an, as an established channel, not an if or when, but, but now a how channel, one of the most important things to keep in mind is that this shift from push to pull creates an entirely new paradigm for how we do category management. Um, and it calls for a new set of online of best practices in that space, new strategies, new KPIs that map to your offline and traditional KPIs, and certainly new measurement tools. One of the coolest things about this, this space is that measurement is actually much more accessible than it's ever been for brick and mortar because of the advances in technology. So use technology, the same technology that's powering and accelerating e-commerce to also accelerate your ability to understand and activate and, and win in that space. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, and so as I said up front, yes, e-commerce is tipping. We still have time to influence. The leaders today in e-commerce may not be the leaders tomorrow. The technology is shifting, shopper behavior is shifting, and so you know, resist taking a back seat and seeing how this in, in unfolds. Understand what your shoppers want, how your consumers look for your products, and figure out how does that translate online and how can I do things in the online space I've never been able to do in brick and mortar, and take that to a retailer and say, can we partner together to do something different nobody else has ever done before? take that leadership role because the retailers are also looking for that kind of leadership and it will come from any corner of the industry. It doesn't have to be left to those who've already gotten started. So with that, I'm going to pause for a moment um, and hand this back to Paul. Great. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Danny. Uh, amazing insights and uh, really some powerful and actionable tips here for our attendees. Uh, so we're now in the uh, question and answers portion of the program. Um, you could enter your questions via the uh, questions box located on the participant panel. Uh, and I do see one that did come in about um, the PDF version of the slides. So yes, all attendees will receive a PDF version of the slides and a link to recording uh, within the next two days. Uh, so be on the lookout for that. And while you're uh, entering your questions, uh, Danny's just going to give a, a brief overview on the Clavis Insight platform. Yeah. So, so as you're sending your, your questions in and, and Paul gathers them, we'll do a brief 30-second commercial on Clavis and who we are. Um, our role is basically to use technology to simulate the online shopper. Our automated uh, harvesting tools go out on a, on a daily basis or more frequently in some cases, weekly or, or less frequently, visit the online retailer, simulating a shopper, entering search terms, visiting different products, brings back everything that that virtual shopper sees and organizes it into our fully automated um, SaaS platform, software as a service, meaning it's accessible from any device, doesn't require any software download, fully cloud-based and accessible, and uh, can be configured for any number of brand SKUs, online stores, um, and even countries. Um, <clears throat> we also have just announced in the last two weeks the addition of coverage of mobile web and app. Very interesting dynamics here in terms of what's happening uh, between desktop, mobile web, and app. Every retailer is approaching this differently and it's had different implications on things like search um, and even how content is being surfaced. Certainly makes sense to be auditing those platforms as well so you have a full view of the world, of your, of your, of your world. And speaking of world, uh, we have capabilities uh, around the world, any retailer, any language. Um, we have the ability to monitor. We are active in over 20 countries and 10 different languages currently um, and, and adding more every day. Clavis as an organization, just so you understand, is a Dublin-based company. Uh, Dublin is where our development and uh, customer support team is based. Out of our Boston office, we have headquartered uh, sales, uh, business consulting services, and our marketing organization. We have a team in China to support our customers' local China teams 
certainly a different set of considerations and requirements there relative to language and culture. So we have a team on the ground there, and then in India where our data acquisition happens. And then finally, uh, my role in all of this is I, I run our business consulting services group. We are really here to make sure that our customers are successful in e-commerce. We don't want to just hand you over a tool and, give, and then leave it to you to take the data forward. We really want to help our customers learn how to use the data, how to apply it to e-commerce with some of the insights we shared today, and really excel. And that can mean everything from onboarding and training all the way through to executional support to actually fix things online, and we also do custom projects, research, and test learns. Thanks, Dan. A wonderful overview. Um, question just came in that I love. Uh, so uh, what? And basically, the question is, uh, what roles are the different devices? So you know, uh, desktop, mobile apps, mobile, playing in the online grocery shopping mission. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the the I, I think desktop we 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 have a really good handle on. That's that's your anchor. It's still the majority of of online shopping and browsing today. It's shifting, and certainly in certain markets like China, mobile is way ahead of desktop. Most other markets, mobile is getting there. Um, but what I would say is. I like to think about a smartphone as the equivalent of an impulse category. So you're at the check stand, you see a candy bar, you buy it. Mobile can serve, smartphone can serve that same function. You're on the train or you're out and about, you think of something you need. It literally happened to me on the way in this morning. I got a text from my wife, can you order whatever? I went to my Amazon app and as I walked into the office, I placed the order and, and, and off it went. So it can have that sort of impulse role. Then you have tablets, which also play a little bit of a different function. Um, they tend to be more, uh, more a hybrid. They're really, we call them mobile because it, they're either um, served by mobile web or, or app. Um, but it tends to be more of an at-home, kind of a dual screen experience. Might be watching TV and have their tablet open in front of them because uh, that consumer shopper is emailing or researching or whatever it may be. Uh, so each of these devices does play a different function, and then based on which device you're on will depend whether you see desktop, mobile web, or app. Great. Thanks, Danny. Uh, great question here about the importance of uh, ratings and reviews. Uh, so how would you suggest motivating shoppers to you know, actually rate and review your product? Sure. Um, three different ways that, that predominantly there are to, to accelerate this. Um, first and foremost, we'll be using a retailer program that's available. Uh, Amazon's Vine program is the most prominent and well-known, where they have their top 1,000 or so reviewers um, who, who have earned that status by providing quality reviews, but also unbiased reviews. Um, and so those are you know, pay-for programs, but you get an unbiased result. So the caution there is be sure that products you put into the program, you're going to get, you know, that the product's a good product, right? Because if it's a mediocre product, you're going to get mediocre reviews. They're not incented to uh, leave positive reviews. Whether it's positive or negative, their incentive is just to leave reviews and leave quality reviews. Um, so retailer program being number one. Uh, the second way would be using your brand websites. A, a number of brand websites now have activated the capability to gather consumer reviews and feedback on the product. And then using a syndicating service like a Bizarre Voice, um, and, and there's certainly others out there to take those reviews and syndicate them out to retailers who are, are in the programs and ability able to receive the syndicated reviews. And then the third would be using your CRM database. So CRM is generally reserved for sending emails out about a new product or social media activation, some kind of a sweepstakes promotion, whatever it may be. Uh, increasingly, brands are getting savvy about increasing a, an e-commerce call to action so that if they see something in the email, they can purchase right away. This is another tool that could also be used to drive ratings and reviews. Those names that are in your CRM database are your most loyal customers. They've given you your, their email information because they want to know more about the brand and they're potentially advocates for your brand. So having a dedicated email campaign to encourage ratings and reviews can be a great way to do that. And retailers would be super receptive to this. If you've got a product that has you know, 500 views on Amazon but two on Target, Target might actually be really interested in working with a brand that says, I'm going to drive 300,000 people to your site to leave reviews and in exchange I want X. So that would be the other, uh, the, the third way that you could, you, you could look at incenting or increasing the number of reviews on products. Great. Uh, another question just came in. So for, you know, we're just building our team and looking for the best places to get started. Is there one lever that we should concentrate on? Um, so you know this, this is about fundamentals at, at our stage in the in the in the, the evolution of e-commerce. So if you're going to start somewhere, it's be in stock, right? So I mean, it, it it seems so super simple, but.
but I have seen brands go really fast and aggressively and invest heavily in content before they were ready on the fundamentals, before they had really even understood what products each retailer was carrying and was it the right set of products and they're creating content for products that have been delisted. I'm not saying that content isn't important, it absolutely is, but think about above the fold first. Make sure you've got the right assortment and your products are in stock. Uh, from there, once you've got the right assortment of products in stock, images are current, accurate, and up to date. And same thing with your titles, properly representing your brands. Um, and then from there, we get into the more advanced pieces, which is, of course, having good content, features and descriptions as a base, enhanced content or A-plus content as secondary in terms of importance. And then when you really get up on the e-commerce maturity curve, you start getting into things like test and learns and predictive analytics so that we can actually start to predict what will happen uh, based on bodies of research and, and get even better about accelerating sales and conversion. Great. Here's a long one, but I think a good one. So. Uh, you mentioned that certain product categories, heavier, lower dollar, et cetera, will ultimately fit better uh, in a grocery delivery and or click and collect model. Uh, online growth in these categories is currently constrained by limited retailer capacity in these services. Do you foresee rapid expansion of grocery delivery, click and collect by store based on uh, mass merchandiser and or regional grocers in the, in the near future? Sure, sure, and it's a great question, and just to paraphrase, basically, for those categories that have so far been constrained by e-commerce, they're ready to go, but the retailers, particularly in the U.S., haven't caught up. Is that going to change? I absolutely believe it will. Uh, there's a general perception, particularly in the U.S., that the U.S. is the leader in e-commerce globally. Uh, if you take a look at the U.K. and, and secondarily the France, France market, there's a much higher household penetration of online shopping, and the reason for that is brick and mortar retailers got made a move first in e-commerce before the pure plays got going, which is opposite of the U.S. As a result, they have a very mature and established business around click and collect. Uh, so we know that this is a successful model in other parts of the world. Now, there's ge geographical differences when you look at population density in certain countries versus the U.S. that is going to influence that, but we are definitely seeing a rapid acceleration in the U.S. Of it's being called buy online, pick up in store, more predominantly in the U.S., but at the end of the day, it's the click and collect or, or, uh, it's, it, or uh, contrarily a drive or pickup format uh, where shoppers are adding, uh, retailers are adding this capability. Um, Amazon Fresh, certainly expanding. You've got Fresh Direct and Peapod who are already in the space. And then any, and Target's recently added buy online, pick up in store. Um, Walmart has, uh, is testing two or three locations with a pickup format where you, you just drive up and they load your car. Um, we are seeing retailers in the U.S. figuring this model out, and that is only going to accelerate e-commerce adoption, and it's certainly good news for those brands that so far haven't been able to really excel in e-commerce. Great. Uh, well, thank you, Danny. That's um, about all the time that we do have currently for the uh, question and answer uh, period. Um, so obviously, thank you all for uh, your attendance here today and for your wonderful questions. Very good and uh, very engaged audience today. Uh, just a quick note, a survey will appear uh, as you exit the webinar, so certainly let us know your thoughts, um, both on the content of the webinar as well as potential suggestions for future webinars. Uh, anyone who receives or completes the survey will receive a copy of our newest white paper, Adapting Cap Category Management Capabilities for the Fast-Growing Online Channel. And a programming note, uh, our next webinar are actually scheduled for March 25th and March 26th. And we'll be taking a, a deeper dive into how candy and confectionery brands can uh, best reach their consumers online. Uh, so certainly be on the lookout for our registration information on that uh, in the upcoming newsletter and in early March. Uh, this concludes the webinar. Uh, as I noted, uh, you will be able, or all attendees will receive a copy of the on presentation and a link to the on-demand webinar uh, within the next two to three days. Uh, and once again, thank you all for attending and have a wonderful rest of the day.